Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Crad COVID Readings. I'm Keith Ari the Candidate, and this week we are doing a theme again. This week, uh, because I am currently writing a new tale of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet, uh, one of my cycle of urban fantasy stories set in Key West, Florida, um, I'm also going to be reading three of my previous tales of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. We are starting with a story that was in an anthology last year called Unearthed, which was uh, put together by Kara Dennison and is all about containers that have been unearthed. Uh, that was the theme of the anthology, and so I provided this, a story called Run For Your Life. When I approached the wreck at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, I was suddenly gripped with utter panic, more scared than I'd ever been in my life. This was no small accomplishment, given that in the last year or so, I've dealt with a sea monster, a dragon, a nixie, a mean-spirited water fay, a god out to destroy the world, and a soul-sucking blues musician. But the minute my dive buddy and I swam toward the wreck, I was suddenly consumed with getting the hell away from that boat. I stopped swimming and pinwheeled my arms and legs to turn around. Rance Demetrijan, the aforementioned dive buddy, had been taking pictures of the boat with his smartphone protected by a waterproof case. He noticed the bubbles from my sudden panic turned, stared at me, then headed toward where I was. By the time he did that, though, I was far enough away that I'd calmed down considerably. Having said that, my breathing had gotten much heavier, hence the bubbles, and that was going to affect my air supply. The biggest problem with scuba diving is that you can't actually talk to your dive buddy. Rance and I had been diving together for a while, though, so we were pretty good at communicating with gestures and the like. I made it clear that I wasn't going anywhere near the wreck. Then I headed for the surface, because I needed to talk about this. We made our safety stop, and I could see the look of concern on his face as our bodies shed nitrogen before continuing up to the, to the lower pressure of sea level. Eventually, we surfaced near where Chico, our boat, was anchored. Pulling out his regulator while treading water, Rand said, That was exceedingly unusual behavior, Cassie. What happened down there? I wish I knew. Your facial expression was one I've never really observed on you before. It was one of pure fright. I nodded. Good! I hate to be that fucking frightened and not look the part. What was it that frightened you, exactly? I have absolutely no clue. We swam back to Chico and climbed, clambered back onto the deck. There was no sign of the other six divers on the trip, which wasn't a surprise, as Rance and I came up sooner than expected. Seven divers, plus the dive master, was the maximum any of the three 29-foot boats used by the Seacliffs dive shop, named Groucho, Chico, and Harpo, could take on a trip safely. As usual, the Saturday at 1 p.m. dive was chock full of tourists. The other six, besides me, the dive master, and Rance, were a family of newbie dive enthusiasts from Regina, Canada. Their last vacation was to Hawaii, and the father, mother, three kids, and eldest son's boyfriend wanted to go diving on this vacation to Key West as well. Back at the shop on Stock Island, the eldest son had said, Ms. Zukov, we heard that after hurricanes, sometimes wrecks get unearthed. Do you know any of those? One or two, yeah, I'd replied. And please, call me Cassie. It was early November, and tropical storm season almost always resulted in stuff being kicked up from under the seabed, including the occasional shipwreck. Hell, one hurricane dumped an entire wreck onto Dog Island up by the Panhandle recently. The reefs around the Keys have claimed a ton of boats over the centuries. And I'd heard through the diving grapevine that there were a few old wrecks now poking out through the silt. So I took Rance and the Canadians, which is totally the name of my next band, up the Gulf of Mexico along the path of the most recent storm. Hilariously, Rance and I were the ones who found one, at least until they gave me the willies. I'm very concerned, Cassie, Rand said as he pulled his hood off, his dark, wet hair now flying out in all directions. Given everything that you've been through of late, the notion of you being frightened by something so mundane as a shipwreck is worrisome to say the least, especially given the writing on the ship. I blinked. What writing? I hadn't gotten close enough to notice anything. It looked like Norse runes. He pulled out the smartphone and called up the pictures he'd been taking before. Oh, that's very not good. I looked at the picture, and sure enough, the letters on the hull looked like the Roman alphabet redrawn as stick figures, so definitely Scandinavian runes. I didn't know enough to translate them, unfortunately. It was probably an old Viking boat that wound up down there. 
You see, the reason why I've had encounters with dragons and nixies and gods and things is because I am a Norse fate goddess, one of the Deesir. No one was more surprised than me when I found out six months ago. That was when I stopped the god from destroying the world. Said god was Loki, and I'd since become kind of his caretaker to make sure he doesn't do anything stupid again. He was one of several members of the Norse pantheon in my life, the others including Odin, Loki's ex Sigyn, and a giant named Gerard. So I should have had, if anything, an affinity for a Viking ship. They're my people, kind of. Instead, I got a major-ass panic attack. Not good at all, as that probably meant magic was involved. Every time magic showed up in my life, it meant shit was about to get even crazier than usual. And I say that knowing that that shit is pretty much my baseline. Eventually, my Canadian family resurfaced, sad that they hadn't found any wrecks, though they did find some wonderful undersea life to swim around with and take pictures of, including blue angelfish and a spiny lobster. The daughter was joking about grabbing the lobster to eat, at which point the father said it was lobster season and she could have. I refrained from comment, but I preferred that folks leave the lobster hunting to the professionals who make their living doing it. We still had an hour left in the dive, and it was only 20 minutes back to Stock Island where Seacliffs was located, so the family went down to where we found our Viking ship. Rance and I stayed behind while they did their second dive. I was too freaked out to go back underwater again. That night, we both wound up at our usual spot, Mayor Fred's Saloon, to see 1812 play. One of the Norse gods I mentioned, Sigyn, was the drummer for that numerically named cover band. She went by Ginny Blake. And among the regulars at Mayor Fred's, besides me and Rance, were Loki and Odin, or, as most folks around here knew them, Sigurd Jarlson and V.E. Bolberg. The pair of them joined me and Rance at the table by the tree while 1812 was still setting up. If you read the bar's website, it will tell you that the ficus tree around which Mayor Fred's was built was Key West's hanging tree in the 19th century. What the site leaves out is that the tree is also a branch of Yggdrasil, the world tree of Norse myth that binds the nine worlds together. Naturally, I told the pair of them about the boat. It seems, little Dees, Loki said, that the boat is warded against you. Loki insisted on calling me that, even though I was half a foot taller than him. Why me? The thing's been underwater for ages. Rance added, I did a little bit of online research while we were waiting for the other divers to return from their second underwater sojourn, and as best as I can tell from the design of the ship, it's got to be at least 600 years old. I nodded. So warding against me seems unlikely, given that I was only born 28 years ago. Odin looked at Rance with his one good eye. Did you record images of the vessel? Nodding, Rance fondled his phone and called up the picture he showed me. Loki looked over Odin's shoulder as he regarded Rance's phone. Oh, hell's teeth, the trickster said. So that's what happened to it. What happened to what? I asked. Odin sighed. I suppose I should have realized that it sank. Why else would it just disappear? I can think of several more entertaining ways off the top of my head, little brother, Loki said with a mischievous grin. I'm sure you can. Nonetheless, it is my sad experience that the mundane is far more likely than the complex. The world can be a depressingly ordinary place at times. Loki chuckled. Your view of the world differs greatly from mine. I find it far more fascinating than that. Yet you keep trying to destroy it. What can I say, All Father? I contain multitudes. <laughs> Excuse me, I said, folding my arms in annoyance. Loath as I am to interrupt this incredibly idiotic philosophical debate, if one of you doesn't start explaining what you saw in that picture, I'm dumping the rest of my beer on your heads. My apologies, Cassie, Odin said. The runes in the image spell out Hrothgar's pride. It's a legendary sailing ship that was never becalmed, regardless of the weather. But it also never stayed in port for fear of destroying it. <laughs> Let's see why Hrothgar was proud of it, I muttered. Odin went on. And that it was Hrothgar's pride explains why you were unable to approach it, Cassie. The ship is warded against any who are of Asgard. Rance frowned. Why would a ship captain want to keep people from Asgard off his boat? A question I was unable to determine the answer to, Odin said, as I could not approach the boat to query the captain. He never disembarked. Well, the boat couldn't stay in port, as the Allfather said, Loki added. They had to use small rowboats to resupply, and even then they had to do it quickly before the boat got too far. Hrothgar was an explorer, and he loved the opportunity to visit new places, so I'm not surprised that he wound up in what they all thought of as the New World back then. I stared at Loki with suspicion. You know a hell of a lot about it there, Sparky. 
Oh, let's just say that anyone who wants to keep Asgardians out is someone I'm interested in. It appeals to my sense of the perverse. I don't know if I'd call that sense so much as a sickness, but whatever. At this point, 1812 was ready to start, so the conversation ceased as we got a fantastic set of rock and roll cover tunes. The band continued to 3 a.m. By then, the other three had already left. Rance was a federal agent, and even though the next day was Sunday, he had a meeting of some sort in the morning in Miami relating to a case he was working on that he couldn't talk about. Loki spent the time between sets flirting with Jenny. He was trying to win her back, much to my chagrin. He was also failing, much to his chagrin. But he left once the second set started. And Odin left around 2 a.m., having asked to be on my 1 p.m. dive the next day. Yes, Odin is a diver. In fact, it's a pretty damn good one. Around 3.15 or so, I was finishing off my last beer before stumbling back home to the bed and breakfast where I both lived and worked, when a very elegant-looking couple walked in. They were both incredibly tall. I'm a 5'11 woman, so I don't say that lightly. And made a beeline right for my table. The man, who had a thick salt and pepper beard, dark hair tied back in a ponytail, and an awkward gait, said, You are Cassie Zukov of the Desir, are you not? No, I'm Cassie Zukov of the San Diego Zukovs. <laughs> Don't be an idiot, Ejer. Of course it's her, the woman said. She was statuesque with alabaster skin, brown hair tied in elegant circled braids. We wish to speak to you, Dees, on a matter of some urgency. Bar's closing soon, so talk fast, I said, indicating the chairs facing me. Also, it's Cassie, please. Every time you call me Dees, I want to respond with, or that! <laughs> they folded their huge forms, seriously, they were both about six foot five, onto the tiny, tiny wire frame chairs. So, I said after gulping down the rest of my beer, if you are Aegir, then you must be Ron, the gods of the sea. The woman nodded. We understand that you encountered the wreck of the Hrothgar's pride. And how did you come to understand that exactly? Aegir said, Two ways. The first, he was interrupted by Mira, one of the servers. I'm sorry, she said, but you need to order something if you want to stay here, and it better be something you can drink fast, as last call was 15 minutes ago. Then why are you serving us? Ron asked imperiously. Okay, snottily, but she had the gravitas to make her snottiness sound imperial. Mira smiled sweetly. Because you're sitting with Cassie. If you weren't, I'd have thrown you out by now. I grinned. It pays to be a regular sometimes. Two of your finest ales, please, Ejir said. That got Mira all confused, but I quickly said, Just get three of my usual, Mira. Thanks. Okay, Cass. She went off to fill the order. You were saying, I prompted Ejir. We have been keeping an eye on undersea explorers such as yourself who tour the remains of wrecked seafaring vessels. Wow, that's incredibly creepy. In addition, Ron said, we have kept an eye on you as well. That's even more creepy. Perhaps, but you are Adis. The face of our, fate of our kind has been less than kind of late, and your actions have already had a direct bearing on the few of us who remain. Besides which, we are, as you say, gods of the sea. All that happens on the waters of Midgard are within our purview. Mira came back with three beers. I dropped a few bills onto her tray, which covered the drinks as well as a very generous tip. Keep it, I said. She smiled. Thanks, Cass. I wasn't kidding about drinking fast, though. Ehor's going to kick you guys out soon. I gulped a good portion of my beer, then said, Leaving aside the invasion of my privacy, which I'd appreciate you stopping, please, purview be damned, I'm assuming that you can't get anywhere near Hrothgar's pride either? If you cannot, Idris said, then neither may we. The spell keeps any from the other eight worlds away. So it's not just Asgard, but anyone not from Midgard? Or touched by the other worlds as you are, Ron said. Ginny walked over then. Idris, Ram... Sigin, Idris said coldly. I am not surprised to see you in such a disreputable place. Given how your feasts often ended up, I'd say a Key West bar on a Saturday night is a step up from what you're used to, Jimmy said. Ron smiled. I always did like you, Sigin, though your taste in men is quite abominable. Join us, please. It's good to see you. Guys, the clock's ticking, I said. Why do you care about Hrothgar's pride? Because, Ron said, her smile fading, Hrothgar stole something from us. We want it back, and it's on that vessel. We've already established that I can't get at it. Your mortal paramour can. I assume she meant more ants. First of all, he's not my paramour, we're just friends. Jenny snorted at that. I pointed an accusatory finger at Jenny. Shut up, you. Then back it runs. Second of all, he's an agent of law enforcement. He's not going to steal something off an unclaimed ship like that. 
It's probably illegal, and it's definitely unethical. You are a dece. You should be able to convince him. Besides, Ron leaned in toward me and spoke in a conspiratorial whisper. I am quite sure that Loki is the one responsible for Hrothgar's being in possession of our, our property. I wondered what that hesitation was about. What were you going to say before you decided on property? Forgive my wife, Idris said. She sometimes struggles with your language. Looking at him, I said, and I seem to recall you and Loki not being on the best of terms. His killing one of your servants, you throwing him out of your feast. That was a long time ago, Idris said dismissively. It has all to do with his conspiring with Hrothgar to steal from us. Please, Deese. Ron started, then caught herself. Please, Cassie, will you help us? The wreck belongs to a man centuries dead. Surely retrieving one large container will do no harm. I sighed. I really didn't want to drag Rance into this. We weren't dating, really, though I did see him naked when a Nixie almost fucked him to death before I saved his ass, but the only other diver I knew who was aware of my secret life as a fate goddess and who wasn't also whammied against Hrothgar's pride was Bobby Molesky, the guitarist from 1812, and she hated wreck diving. I'll talk to him, I said neutrally. I left a very long message on Rance's voicemail before I went to bed that night, explaining the whole thing. It was on his personal cell phone, as I didn't think leaving a message on an FBI phone about Norse sea gods asking for favors would be such a hot idea. He called me back Sunday afternoon at 1.30 while I was off on my dive and left a message of his own. Hello there, Cassie. It's Rance. I've been thinking about it all day, which made it really hard to focus on the meeting I had with my CI this morning, but I still got through that okay. And I wasn't supposed to tell you it was a confidential informant I was meeting, so please don't tell anyone, all right? Anyhow, uh, you're right that it might be an issue, but there are so many wrecks down there, and if it's something that belongs to two Norse gods, I think we'd all be better served getting it off the boat before some archaeologists got their hands on it, and goodness knows what, what, knows what might happen. So um, let me know when you think we can go do it. I'm free tonight. Uh, call me back as soon as you can. I chuckled. As usual, Rance never used ten words when a hundred would do. I just finished today's 1 p.m. dive, which was almost the same bunch as yesterday. The six Canadians and me, with Odin in Rance's place. I had already shared with him my visit with, from Eger and Ran. It is good to see that your friend will be able to retrieve the Sea God's property, whatever it might be. You don't know? I grinned. What kind of all-father are you, anyway? One who was warded against that ship, he said seriously. It was quite vexing. I checked with Kara Zimmerman and Andy Wasserstein, the owners of Sea Cliffs. To my relief, there were only five people signed up for the night dive tonight, so only one boat was needed. Even if there were a few last-minute sign-ups, one of the three boats would be free this evening. They let me take it out as long as I paid for the gas. I called Rance back and arranged it with him. He, Odin, and I would reconvene at Sea Cliffs at 9 p.m. That night at night, we took Harpo out to the spot where we found Hrothgar's pride. Odin stayed on the boat while Rance and I went down. I figured I'd get as close as I could, at least. The alternative was Rance diving alone, and sorry, no. You never dive without a buddy. No way that would happen on a boat I was running. Having said that, I wasn't much of a buddy once he went into the wreck. Now that I was in the throes of a panic attack, I could really look at the stupid thing, and I saw that the prow, which, like most Viking ships, was tapered upward with a dragon head on the top, was jutting up from the seabed, but the stern was completely submerged. Rance had brought a flood, flood lamp that was attached to his hood, but it was still absurdly dark down there. I saw a huge cascade of bubbles, and I instinctively moved to swim toward him, at which point my heart started racing and I could feel myself breaking into a sweat, which is a very weird feeling when you're already submerged underwater, let me tell you. I swam back away from Hrothgar's pride and hoped that the sudden mess of bubbles wasn't Rance thrashing around because a piece of wreckage had pinned him down or something. But no, he came swimming out a moment later, pushing a white box ahead of himself. It also had runes on the side of it, and while I couldn't translate them any better than I could translate what turned out to be the name Hrothgar's Pride on the hull, I could at least tell that these runes spelled something completely different. We worked our way back to the surface, pushing the box upward ahead of us. Luckily, it floated, and it wasn't too difficult to navigate it back to Harpo. Odin helped haul it up to the deck, onto the deck, and I couldn't help but notice that the box had no latch, no seams, no nothing. Just a solid white box with black runes etched into it, and no obvious way to get inside it. Maybe it was just a solid box that belonged to Eger and Ron? 
Do you know what that says? I asked Odin once I climbed up the ladder onto the deck and removed my regulator. Yes, and that is what disturbs me. It says, Hevering. I frowned, the name ringing a bell from me, the massive deep dive I did at a Norse myth once I discovered that I was part of it. Isn't that one of Ichir and Ron's daughters? Indeed. Wait, Rand said as he followed me onto Harpo. Are you telling me that there's a person inside this box? Nodding, Odin said. I believe so. The box is sealed and can only be opened magically, and that Hevron's name is etched indicates that it is she who is sealed inside it. Can you open it? I asked. Perhaps. But we must be careful, as to use the wrong spell to open it could endanger Hevron's life. Rance asked, So it's possible that she's still alive, even though she's trapped inside this hermetically sealed box? He shook his head. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised, given that she's an immortal, but still. The box keeps her safe, but allows the one who imprisoned her to use her abilities. This is why Hrothgar's pride was never becalmed. Hevering could manipulate the winds at sea, and Hrothgar obviously used that ability to his own ends. Not all that well, I said, if he couldn't stop the wind from blowing. The enchantment that trapped Hevering is not elegant, Odin said. Either it would use her abilities all the time, or never use them. Even as Odin was talking, though, I was noticing that Harpo was starting to seriously bounce around, and the wind had picked up quite a bit. Um, I'm not liking this, I said. I think that enchantment is still up and running. I'm afraid it would be, yes, Odin said resignedly. I immediately went to yank up the anchor. Half of why we were bucking and weaving in the suddenly increased wind was because we were tethered to the seabed. Once I hauled anchor, that helped, but it was still incredibly choppy. It is well... Odin said that your boat is not powered by sail. Someone needs to tell Hevering that, I said grumpily. And if this is going to keep up like this, no way in hell I can dock at sea cliffs. A voice came from all around me. Worry not, Cassie of the Deceer. After a moment, I realized it was Idris' voice. A second later, the sea god his own self had materialized on the deck alongside his wife and Loki, to my surprise. And based on the baffled expression on his face, to his surprise as well. What in the name of Thor's tiny hammer is going on? Loki asked. All father? Little Dees? What? Aha! I see. The last part was after catching sight of the sea gods. Ager, Ron. I should have known. Ron ignored Loki and instead addressed me. Cassie, I thank you. And you as well, mortal, she added to Rance, for retrieving our property. We shall take... Hold on a second, I said. This isn't your property. That's your daughter. Any particular reason why you referred to Hevering as property? Ron was kind enough to sound abashed when she replied. I felt it would be simpler to refer to it as such rather than explain that it was our daughter who had been captured by Hrothgar. Loki actually did a double take at that. Wait, Hrothgar captured Hevering and put her in that box? Yes, Idris said. And you just let it happen? Loki asked. Idris snarled. We have nine children. We could barely keep track of them when they were in our care, much less once they achieved adulthood. Tell me, Loki, are you able to keep track of all your children? <laughs> Not of late, but in my defense, I was trapped in a cave for 800 years. What's your excuse? What is yours, Ron asked, for aiding Hrothgar in capturing our sweet daughter? Loki put a hand to his chest. My! Dear, my dear Ron, as should be evident, I knew nothing of Hevering's imprisonment until just now. Indeed, I only knew of Hrothgar's pride from research I did on such ships approximately two decades ago, when I was bored in a library. Sigyn had just left me, you see. And, oh, please, I said before he went on, do not protest your innocence. You kind of suck at it. Unfortunately, Odin said quietly, on this occasion my blood brother's protestation is quite sincere. Idrim muttered, that word is never applied to Loki. Ignoring him, Odin went on. Hrothgar's reputation as the captain of a never becalmed ship began shortly after Skaldi imprisoned Loki beneath the earth as punishment for attempting to bring about Ragnarok. He could not possibly have enslaved Hevring. Both sea gods looked completely crestfallen. Idrir said, Then all is lost. The spell may only be re reversed by the person who cast it. If it was not Loki, it was another, and we know not who it was. Or even, Ron added, if the god in question is still alive. Rance raised a hand. Um, excuse me, may I interject a point, if you don't mind? Be silent, mortal, Ron snapped. You have done us a boon, but hey, I snapped right back. I'm the captain of this boat, and I'm a lot more interested in what Rance has to say than you right now, so let him talk. Through clenched teeth, Ron said, As you wish, Deese. 
first of all, I need to ask a question, if I might. Why has the boat calmed down? I blinked. I'd been so distracted by all the divine bickering that I hadn't noticed that the wind had died down again. Odin answered. Eger and Ron are linked to Hevering by blood. They, and Hevering's sisters, are likely the only ones who made the gate a magic. That's kind of what I figured. And if there is a genetic link between the parents and the daughter, shouldn't that be enough to allow the parents to free the daughter? Ron and Eger exchanged glances. Then Eger spoke. The mortal may well be correct. We shall attempt it. I would not advise it, Loki said, at which point the other shoe dropped in my head. Such a spellcasting be, must be very precise, or it will risk killing everyone. Do not be foolish, Loki, Odin said. That would only occur if the person inside the container is not their daughter. But I was shaking my head and staring at Loki. You lying son of a bitch! Again, Loki put a hand to his chest. Me? Oh, don't even try to play the innocent. Eger was right. You and Sincere have never even been on speaking terms. What are you... I interrupted him and turned to Odin. I'm guessing that the spell will also backfire if there's another person in there who isn't their daughter? Yes, but it wasn't. It isn't just hovering in the box, I said. Hrothgar's in there, too. Not possible, Eger said. Completely possible, I said. Loki was surprised that Hrothgar captured Hevering, but not that Hevering was on the boat, right? I... Loki said, that's absurd! I Save it. Fake goddess. Remember, I can see through artifice, and you're one big quivering mass of artifice. I also didn't buy for a second that you research anything in a library in your life. You knew all about Hrothgar's pride, and it wasn't from reading up on it. I'm guessing that Ron and Eger are right, but not that you helped Hrothgar capture Hevering. You just smuggled Hevering onto the boat so they could be together. That is absurd! Eger bellowed. No daughter of mine would consort with a mortal! Ron, though, looked stricken. No. No what? Eger asked angrily. Hevering had said that she found a mortal attractive, but I assumed it was some sort of phase she was going through. I rolled my eyes. Didn't you just say a minute ago that she was an adult and on her own? Do not criticize, Dees, until you have children of your own, Ron said testily. I think I'll criticize anyhow, thanks. I can just imagine it. Hrothgar and Hevering on the run, warded against anyone from the other eight worlds to keep hidden from Hevering's disapproving parents. Odin was rubbing his bearded chin. If Cassie is correct, and the pair of them are encased willingly, that simplifies matters immensely. A simple unbinding should be effective, since there is no imprisonment. But wouldn't they want it to be easy for someone to get them out once whatever danger they thought they were in had passed? Rance asked. Almost definitely, Odin said. I sighed. Then <laughs> let's please do it already. Of course. Odin sat down on one of the benches on the deck and closed his eye. After several seconds, he started chanting words in a language that I recognized but didn't know. When I stopped Loki from bringing about Ragnarok back in the spring, the spell I cast was in that same language. The box started to glow. Is it supposed to do that? I asked, hoping the answer was yes. Suddenly, the box shimmered and seemed to explode. There was no shrapnel, just a major flash of light, a big popping sound, and suddenly two people were standing in front of us. The man was blonde-haired with a thick beard, and was screaming, Get away from me, you mad woman! The woman was completely naked, her hair the color of the sea, and flowing in the wind that had suddenly kicked up again. Hrothgar, no! You can't mean that! Eger bellowed. What is going on here? Hevry, why have you chosen to be with this mortal? This mortal didn't choose her back! Hrothgar cried. It was glorious for a while, but we had to keep running, and I grew weary of always being at sea. We were meant to be together forever, Hevering said. No! All right, I yelled. Everyone bring it down a bit. Ron walked up to Hevering and waggled a finger in her face. We've been searching all over Midgard for you, and you've been hiding from us. Hey, I said bring it down. I grabbed her shoulder and pushed her away from her daughter. Do not manhandle me, Dees. Like I said, my boat, my rules. You're a Dees! Hevering floated toward me, and hilariously, it was only then that I realized her feet weren't touching the deck. Then you know that Hrothgar and I are fated to be together forever. No such thing as forever, I said, not even for the Aesir. Most of the gods are gone, Hevering. Including all your sisters, Eger said quietly. They all became insubstantial, as did many of the more of the Aesir and the Jotuns and more. As worship dwindled, so did we. Hevering blinked. People don't worship us anymore? That's not fair. 
life isn't fair, kiddo. I said, now calm down. How exactly did you two wind up in that white box? Hrothgar pointed at Hevron. She imprisoned us. I told her I was finished with her, that I wished to return to dry land, but she would hear none of it. She summoned a hurricane that destroyed the ship and killed my crew, except for the two of us. She trapped us both in that coffin. It was always meant to house us, my love, Hevron said, in case my parents got too close. Turning to Loki, Hrothgar said, I should have known that your returning of the favor you owed me would result in disaster. Never make a bargain with a trickster. I grinned. Gee, Loki, what favor did you owe him? Never mind, Loki said quickly. You asked, nay, begged me to find a way to make Hevering yours forever. Those were, in fact, your exact words. Hevering blinked. Wait, you asked Loki to make me yours forever? The wind started to kick up again. Eger and Ron both turned fierce expressions on Loki. You ensorcelled our daughter! I ensorcelled many daughters, Loki said with a shrug. I was young and carefree. As opposed to now, when you're old and stupid, I said. Ignoring me, Loki continued. And right after I ensorcelled your daughter, I tricked Hoder into killing Balder. After that, I'm afraid my participation in the events of the Nine Worlds was reduced to being tied to a rock in a cave. He said that last with a nasty glance at Odin. Look, I said, what's done is done. It all happened a long time ago, but Hevering and Hrothgar are both free now, which puts you both one up on most of the rest of your people 800 years later. That got Hrothgar's attention. Eight? Eight hundred? I nodded. Trust me when I tell you the Vikings are long gone. I turned to Eger and Ron. So are your other eight daughters. You just got one back. Maybe enjoy that instead of getting all pissed off. Then I turned to Hevering. And you just got a second chance. Try taking advantage instead of trying to keep a dead relationship going. Eger snarled. He did that a lot. There must be payment. For what? I asked. Something that happened centuries ago? Let it go for fuck's sake. Loki's already been punished pretty brutally for a much worse crime. You finally found Hevering. Isn't that enough? Before Idra could snarl again, Ron put a hand on his shoulder. Yes, it is. Hrothgar was still stunned. Eight hundred years? Rance walked up to him. Don't worry, we'll figure out a way for you to assimilate into this new time. It won't be easy, but it's very possible. I shot Rance a grateful look, and then turned to Hevering and said... And you, no, she screamed. This isn't what I wanted. Hrothgar is mine. I folded my arms again and stared right at her as she floated over the deck. Not anymore, he's not. In fact, I'd say he never was. Loki put a whammy on you. Maybe just move on with your life and... Again, she yelled, no, and then floated off on a gust of wind. She disappeared from sight in about half a second. I yelled after, after her, maybe put some clothes on at some point. Idris said, Do not worry, Cassie. We shall speak to her. Once we find her, Ron said, though that shall be easier now than it was an hour ago. Thank you, Cassie of the Desir, Idris said warmly. We are in your debt. Come, Ron. Another gust of wind and the two sea gods floated away in the same direction as Hevering. I glowered at Odin. Thanks for all the help. Odin actually smiled. I cast the spell that released the pair of them and kept the effects from being fatal to anyone. I thought it wasn't going to be fatal, I said with a quick, frightened look at Rance. The spell would be harmless had both participants entered the container willingly, but Hrothgar did not, which caused issues. In any case, I handled the spellcraft. You handled the rest, and quite well, I might add. Besides, you were a Dece. They were far more like to listen to you about matters of their future than I. I stuck my tongue out at him to show my appreciation, then turned to Rance. Think you can get him set up with a proper ID? What's an ID? Rothgar asked. Rance chuckled. I'll take care of it when I go into the office tomorrow morning. I have some contacts in the U.S. Marshal Service who are very well versed in the art of identity creation, and a lot of them owe me a favor or two. Loki grinned. Is that not how this all began? Apparently, I sighed. Come on, let's head back to see Clips. What is a sea Clips? Hrothgar asked. Odin finally got up off the bench, and that's when I realized how pale he looked. That spell looked like it took a lot out of him, which went a long way toward explaining why he left the mediating to me alone. You did well, Cassie, he said in a soft whisper. I just didn't want a couple of pissed off sea gods on my boat in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. No way, that ends well. What's a Mexico? Hrothgar asked. I rolled my eyes as I got the engine running. It was going to be a long 
That is Run for Your Life, uh, Tale of Cassie Zuko. Uh, if you can find a copy of Unearthed, uh, edited by Kara Dennison, uh, it's a little hard to find now, but you might be able to find a copy of it online somewhere. Uh, and it also will be reprinted in my next Cassie Zuko collection, which will be called Ragnarok in a Hard Place. I'm hoping to have that out in either 2021 or 2022, depending. Um, check me out online at dekendido.net. My blog is at dekendido.wordpress.com. Uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash crad. Please subscribe to this channel, and please stay safe. Thank you very much for watching.